However, we now have an hour of lightning talks, and so I'd like to introduce just Chris to the stage. Is that... I wasn't expecting it to be quite that literal. Uh, but yeah, hi, I'm just Chris. Sorry? That wasn't what I... Hi, just Chris. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, shall we start the lightning talks? Yeah. Yes? Stop. Great. Uh, Jacob Ross, you're on deck. But first, Brenda Wallace, who's going to tell us about something that you can't buy from supermarkets. Cool. Hi. Oh. All right. Hi, everybody. Who likes potatoes? Yeah. Sweet. Yes. Okay, I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I'm going to talk about potatoes before the white people got there. Right. This is the Pacific Ocean. It is huge. If you hold the globe at the right angle, it's pretty much half the planet. There is New Zealand, otherwise known as Aotearoa. There is Polynesia, and there were people going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, you know, like the airlines do now. And there are the potatoes. <laughs> Cap, um, if you asked a botanist maybe a few years ago, how did potatoes get to New Zealand? They would have said, we don't know. They magically appeared in the 18th century. Captain Cook must have bought them. If you ask the indigenous people, they'll say, we went and got them, duh. We go back and forth across the Pacific. We know what we're doing. We got the potato here. That's the story. All right, the word for potato is tewa. Uh, it sounds a lot like potato. It's generally used to mean potatoes that were here before white people. They're really, really pretty. So this is called winnie winnie. This is uh, kikorangi. It means blue. Um, it's useless for anything except chips. Um, this one is fataro. It's my favorite. You can put it in a slow cooker with a curry, and you can cook it and cook it, and it never turns to mush, and it tastes delicious. All right, this is kumara. Um, kumara is what they grew before potatoes. Um, you can't grow kumara very far south because it, it's from the warm. Um, so I, but I did because climate change. So before that, yeah, those are my comments. Yay! No, no. Um, this is an open source project. Um, you can put your potatoes there. I'm the maintainer now. Um, you put your potatoes in there, and you can find all this data about it. I've got to speed up. Here's Fatero. It's a specialisation of a potato. You can see they have different values. Um, if you can put things that are not potatoes in this thing. It works too. When you plant them, it'll give you a progress bar. You'll know when your food will be ready to eat. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a Fijoa tree. If you can't remember when your Fijoas are ready, it'll tell you when it was last year. The data's all there. I think I need to build the feature that makes it a bit more obvious. Pull request, very welcome. All right. Um, this is two people who have potatoes. They're different potatoes. They're in different places. One of them says, I have this. The other one says, I have this. Do you want to trade? Yes, no. I built this. This is Tinder for potatoes. <laughs> Thank you. You can find most of these potatoes at your local countdown. Uh, if you want to visit, if you don't have a local countdown, you can go to Wellington at Kiwi PyCon, which is later this month. That is also the 10th uh, PyCon for New Zealand. Uh, so yeah, that's in Wellington. Get to it if you like this conference. Uh, Eric Wang, uh, you're up, uh, Eric Wang, sorry, you're up on this, uh, on this side. But first, uh, Jacob Ross. Testing? Cool. All right, I'm going to try and teach you how to program a real actual quantum computer in five minutes. So why? Because there are proven ad, um, algorithmic scaling cost advantages for quantum computers over classical computers. Everyone's excited because they do some really hard things really well. They don't do them yet. Read about it online. Um, who has them? A bunch of people. So the, in, in, in green are uh, people who have hardware that you can actually get on and control online on quantum cloud services. They, are, they have differences. Read about them online. Um, there are open source software um, available, uh, also there, um, which can both control real actual quantum computers and simulate you controlling real actual quantum computers if you want to test stuff or you can't afford one. Uh, most people can't, so use these people's hardware. They're really cool. So what? Um, 
I, I will have a, a link later for you if you actually want to read about quantum mechanics, but the short version is that instead of um, the, sta the state of the machine being described as classical bits one or zero, they are quantum bits which are some combination of zero and one. Um, the it, elementary logical operations are implemented in term, by, by, by things called quantum gates, which modify the state vector of the, of the qubit. Um, programs are instantiated by writing so-called circuits, which take qubits in on the left, do some stuff to them with these gates, which act on one or more qubits, and then measure them at the end. Measurement is definitely the strangest part of quantum mechanics, and I'm going to walk right around that minefield. Um, <laughs> but I'm just going to tell you that when you measure a, uh, a quantum state, you get a binary outcome, not a continuous one, um, which is determined. The probability of getting one or zero is determined by some geometric relation, which I probably don't have time to go into. But um, we have a diagram here of three qubits, which have been measured in the state zero, one, one. Um, so let's get to it. So I am going to show you how to program Rigetti's quantum cloud service. You can go to this website, you can request for an invitation, and they will send one to you eventually. <laughs> so um, it, when you get one, then you get online. Um, this is the dashboard. So as you can see, I have an upcoming reservation right now for the Aspen 4, um, Aspen 4, Q, 4 2 qubit device, eight, whatever. That's a code. doesn't matter. Um, and the point is that I have time on a real actual quantum computer um, which is being co-processed by, by, by a real actual virtual machine, that's not surprising, um, in which I have written this code. So the, the point of this code is to show you how easy it is to win Nobel Prizes. So um, I just import a bunch of things, and then in this block here, I will just, d just um, designate which quantum computer I want to be running and which qubits on that lattice I want to be running. This is my program. It is now execute. It's now defined. Um, it is a very simple circuit which takes two qubits, puts one in the superposition of zero and one, and entangles the other one with it, creating the so-called Bell state, which is here, famous for some prize, uh, some experiments in the middle of the 20th century, which showed that local realism is not a thing. Things do not have actual values before you measure them. You create them when you measure them, or things can communicate faster than the speed of light, or both. We don't know which. <laughs> So this just sets up the, um, the actual experiment, which basically measures both of the qubits along different axes. So I mentioned there's a, there's a geometric factor, which you can read about in your, at your leisure. Um, and then this it, relatively surprisingly short looking function basic, um, basically does all the experiments for us. And now it's just running, a little star. And so this will spit out a plot, which has what I like to call the Nobel Prize line on it, which is um, there. So we just violated the Bell inequalities. <laughs> Quantum physics works. Go home. Program one. It's fun. Also, check out Penny Lane. Um, it is an awesome repository by, um, uh, by Xanadu Quantum Computing. Um, it has a wrapper for TensorFlow and Keras, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know how to machine learning, um, but it allows you to use ML tools to optimize your quantum computers. So you can breed the buzzwords. <laughs> so I read, read once on the internet that I was born too, young, um, too early to explore space, but I was born just in time to explore the quantum world, and I think that's very exciting. Come along. Thank you. Okay, uh, on deck we have Yaakov. Um, this here is Eric. This is not Eric's handwriting. This is my worst possible handwriting. He's going to talk about calligraphy, um, so this is not his, okay? I promise, like, he actually knows what he's doing. <laughs> all right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great, all right, so let's talk about calligraphy. So who here does calligraphy? Woo. Yes, we have some people, awesome. So now calligraphy can be for everyone. Yay. Yay. <laughs> yes, make some noise. Yay. All right, so let's get started. So. Once upon a time, there was something called spoken language. And then someone invented something called writing. And then they decided to make it even more fancier because in Europe, they decided to kill some birds and take some of the feathers and then turn them into quills. Ooh. But what's so special about quills is that they're hollow and you can cut the ends such that you can pick up some ink and then you can put the ink on your page. So pretty simple. And then until someone invented printing and you no longer had to write anymore. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and then after the Industrial Revolution, 
someone invented something called a fountain pen, and then someone invented something else called a dip pen. They're different, yes. <laughs> and then, how it works is that it's a metal nib, it picks up some ink, and then through this ink, it kind of spills onto the page, and the harder you press, the more ink it spills, and the more ink it spills, the thicker your lines appear. And so now you have thin lines when you press lightly, and now you have thick lines when you press, I guess, harder. <laughs> and then someone invented something even better. It's called a ballpoint pen. Ooh, or otherwise known as a biro pen. How it works is that it has a ball on it, and then ink kind of spill, rolls around this ball, and it just goes onto the page. So then, no more dipping in inks, no more spilling inks, and then we're all happy. Yay! Yay. The only problem is, it's very hard to write calligraphy with a ballpoint pen. Uh, until today. Yay. Yay! But then, some other player came onto the show. It's called the typewriter. Yay! Yay. But, <laughs> yeah, sorry, the Vorak people. Well, it's okay. And then, the typewriter became inherited by the computer. And now we have QWERTY keyboards. And then these things became even more popular. <laughs> so popular such that they even scrapped handwriting class in New South Wales. <laughs> so now no one can write calligraphy or anything close to calligraphy except for a select few. But we should change that. Because as a structural engineer myself, I design buildings and bridges and things. And we do hand calcs all day. And we have really messy handwriting, <laughs> as you can tell. But who even uses pen and paper? The answer is we do. We all do pen. We all use pen and paper, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, not so much. Okay, no, maybe. <laughs> but that's okay. But the good thing about writing stuff is that it's verifiable, it's reproducible, and it's awesome. <laughs> yes. And so we should all do it. And yes, you yourself can do calligraphy. And how do you do it? You don't need to be fancy. You can in fact just use a normal ballpoint pen. Everyone who doesn't have a ballpoint pen. Oh, okay. That's okay. There's a basket I guess at the back of the room. Okay. But the idea is that a ballpoint pen is actually enough. All you need is a piece of paper, a ballpoint pen, and a soft surface underneath. That could be a stack of paper, it could be a newspaper, it could be a soft table, it could be carpet. But the idea is if you press harder, you get a thick line. When you press lighter, you get a thin line. And you can emulate that. This whole slide was written that way. This whole, sorry, presentation, yes. Yeah, I mean, so what can you do? You can write a letter, you can write a postcard, you can write a birthday card, you can write a handwritten letter which reflects what's in your heart. Uh, for example, you can write something like this. I know, it's very formal, but that's okay. <laughs> and if you have a highlighter, you can use Gothic black letter. It's like back in the medieval ages, they used to write like this. You can just take, a, ha take your highlighter and just write like this and copy it. Oh yeah, thanks to you, shout out. And then, Copper plate is the thing I've been writing so far. It's a bit harder, but you can still do it. All you need to do is just copy the sentence. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. How does it work? Well, you do you start by writing Fs, and you do Ls, and then you start writing alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> and I mentioned you'll get there. OK. Give it two weeks. I don't know. Okay. And mathematics is the queen of sciences. This is our jewel. You can do this as well. You can also go light and dark like this as well. <laughs> Greek as well. And then you can even use, and when you're happy, you can use a fancier pen. You can upgrade. And then, that's it. You can start copying the sentence. And that's it. Calligraphy for all. Thanks, Eric. You too can collect your commemorative ICC ballpoint pen in one of the baskets <laughs> at the back of the room and start doing calligraphy today. Up on deck, we have Amber Brown. But first, Yaakov, who's going to tell us about how he's Jewish. <laughs> you can tell by the hat. <laughs> I, I got baited into doing this. Um, someone asked about being Jewish at a conference and said I should share it with everyone. Uh, and of course, as a Jewish person, we get three holy emoji to ourselves. Uh, <laughs> also, thanks, Chris. As they said in Fiddler on the Roof, may God bless and keep the Tsar far, far away from us. <laughs> So I'm Jewish. Uh, Judaism is a bit of a spectrum, and so what I'm going to say is just my own experience. Um, for different people, it'll be different. Uh, if, you, there's, you know, if there's a Jew you know, what they do might be different. Ask them. 
Um, don't assume anything I do is what they do and vice versa. Uh, and if you're Jewish and watching this, as we always say, ask your local Orthodox rabbi, don't take my advice on this. Um, there are also a lot of Orthodox Jews and ultra-Orthodox Jews getting into computer programming, so there are going to be a lot more of us in time. And conferences are a great way to learn, share knowledge, and make connections, but they can be problematic. Specifically, when I'm looking at going to a conference, the first two things I'll look at are time and food. Where it is and who's talking and what it's going to be about comes third at best. So the first thing I'll look at is the time, because um, Saturday is our holiday, it's a Shabbat, that's completely a no-go, I ain't going to a conference then. We've also got the high holidays and other holidays, not called low holidays for some reason, um, and <laughs> can't go then as well. So if we've got something like a one-day Saturday conference, ain't going to it. If you've got a two-day conference on Saturday, Sunday, it's a bit better because I can get half the value at least. Uh, but like if it's not in Sydney, I'll have to travel Friday, stay there over Shabbat, and then go on Sunday. When we get to three or more days, now we're talking. I can still get a fair amount of it, although please don't make me buy an expensive ticket. That also includes Saturday entry because I'll never use it. And when we get to something like LCA, it runs through Monday to Friday. This is heaven for me. I can attend all of it. It's wonderful. Um, all the days in the Jewish calendar, including Shabbat, run from sunset through to sunset, and the Jewish calendar itself is a mess, and if you're a programmer like me, it will make you cry, because <laughs> the first day of the new year is the first day of the seventh month. That's a fun one. Even Apple don't get it right, ICU doesn't get it right, but it, because of this, it means I have to disappear early on Fridays. In winter, this is much earlier than in summer by a matter of about three, four hours. So seeing things like this makes me very sad when they're not recorded. If it's Friday afternoon or Saturday and it's not recorded, I don't even get delayed participation. So I still don't know why Woolworths is a meme. I'm just going with it. <laughs> the other major issue is food or kashrut. If you've heard of kosher, kosher is the adjective. Kashrut is basically the noun. It's not like an allergy. It's an incredibly co complex, convoluted rule set that's very hard to make sense of. If your conference is in the middle of nowhere, chances are very low that I can get kosher food there at all, um, both during the conference and around it, like night, the day before, day after sort of thing. If it's in a major city, that chance goes up exponentially. For example, you know, this was my lunch today. It was made by Lewis's, which is a local kosher catering company, not by the ICC, and it's all wrapped and sealed straight from them. Uh, the, the foil thing is actually a, a reheated component which is wrapped in two layers of foil required by Jewish law for reheating it in a non-kosher kitchen. Whatever you do, don't break the seal, don't break the wrapping, don't break the plastic there. Uh, it also includes a separate set of kosher utensils, different knives and forks wrapped in serviette. I don't know why they thought I needed that much just to eat lunch, <laughs> but they did. Um, and it also has other concerns depending on the time of year. For example, on Friday we started a nine-day global period of Jewish mourning, um, culminating in commemorating the destruction of the two temples a couple thousand years ago. And so during this time, many of us don't eat meat. Uh, during Passover in April-ish, there's a crazy amount of restrictions, which is a lot more than just don't eat bread. And in October-ish, we have Sukkot, in which we generally only eat in basically certain huts with uh, leaves for the roof. And some enterprising Jews figured out how to build one on a trailer or on the back of a ute, or a one, uh, there was one in New York that was a semi-trailer, but please don't make me have to organize one of these just to attend your conference. <laughs> um, the other thing is social events. I can't exactly go out to a random non-kosher restaurant. So I can't just go to you know, pizza, maccas, whatever it is. If it's a food court or a pub, I can generally come along with. Uh, and there's not much chance of having a kosher restaurant that say I could bring everyone else with to as well. So please take this sort of stuff into consideration if you're planning a conference, because when I find your website, I want that to be my reaction and not just closing the tab and walking off miserable. Thank you. Thanks, Yaakov. Uh, OK, so up on deck, we have Peter Hall. Uh, but first, we have Amber Brown, who apparently has an opinion about something. Uh, you, are having difficult, you are having difficulty getting your laptop to display graphics earlier. Is, is everything fixed now? Uh, well, uh, I've just got some ASCII art, so you'll have to deal with that. Um, hi, I would like to talk about PEP594, entitled Removing Dead Batteries from the Python Standard Library. The PEP proposes the removal of modules that are considered old, unused, or unnecessary to be kept in core Python. First drafted in mid-2018, it was assigned a number and listed as PEP on the 20th of May 2019, nearly three weeks after my Python Language Summit talk entitled Batteries Included But They're Leaking. Despite being targeted for the first beta of 3.8, a decision on the PEP has not been made and discussion has not been active since early June. 
Now, the primary concern raised in discussions is that removal of parts of the standard library may break downstream software. Breakage is, of course, undesirable, and it could be said that Python has a structural fear of it, especially from the Python 3 transition. One example of this fear preventing progress is the gelectomy, the project to remove the global interpreter lock and allow better multi-threading. For any significant improvement to occur, the C API would have to change, and as a result, C extensions would have to do a significant amount of work converting their C extensions to something like CFFI. The benefits were not seen as worth the breakage, and further progress has not been made. But it is worth looking at the context of the software that would break. Some of the largest users of C extensions in Python are in the data science world. Breaking them all of a sudden would of course be unacceptable, but the data science sector is one that is also flush with investment and developers, so it could be argued that a gradual transition could be possible before Python makes any breaking changes and avoid any long-term detriment to users. Now looking back at PEP 594, we know it will break some software because some of those old modules are still used, but what kind of software does it break? From the responses and discussions, it seems that a majority of the code that would be permanently broken is code that cannot use replacements or spun out PyPI libraries. Some educational uses are of course outlined, but a majority of it appears to be corporate software where the corporation itself makes it difficult to use the Python package index. I feel like this is an invalid reason to keep modules in a standard library. Keeping these modules around in Python means that enterprise developers are pushing the maintenance burden of the code onto the open source community. Now, Python is mainly maintained by mostly unpaid volunteers, and we should instead realize that code is a time and effort liability. Instead, we should push the burden back onto these companies, companies that clearly have engineering capacity to build on top of these modules. Now, the code does not disappear if it is removed from the standard library. Instead, it becomes something that they must inherit and maintain. One of the modules, AIFF, is an implementation of the lossless audio interchange file format, first developed in 1988 for the Apple Macintosh. Yes, that one. One of the requests for keeping it is from the lead technical director of DreamWorks Animation, where it is outlined that it is still commonly used in the post-production film industry. Now, one of the main reasons that was listed was that it is apparently, uh, apparently it is not usable in Apple's Final Cut Pro software. Uh, is the only thing that's able to be used by the Apple's Final Cut Pro software for lossless audio. And that costs $500 a seat. Now, Final Cut Pro doesn't even support Apple's own modern format for this. And instead of using their cloud to demand Apple or other video production software companies provide support for modern formats, they're instead, providing, uh, st instead relying on volunteers to provide the software which makes them millions of dollars per year. It is our job to push back against this. We should, of course, not break our own community again like we did with Python 3, but we should be willing to break things that make our own lives as volunteer software maintainers easier. We must, for the good of the community, be decisive in our actions and make our live, own lives easier for the coming period. Thank you. Thanks, Hawkey. Up on deck, we have Michael Farrell. Uh, if you've been around the conference and have had a camera pointed directly at you, uh, it was probably by this person here. He's about to tell us why he's been pointing cameras at everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm doing a talk about the fashion of PyCon AU, and I am doing this talk because programmers are notoriously well-dressed people. <laughs> so I've taken a lot of photos, but it would be very unfair to show anybody else first. So. Uh, Everybody look at me. <laughs> Hi, I am wearing jeans and a t-shirt. The t-shirt has a very nerdy joke on it. Um, I semi-seriously think of this as the programmer's uniform, which is a very weak signal. There are a lot of people wearing this who are not programmers, a lot of programmers who aren't wearing this. Let's see some photos. So uh, here's somebody wearing jeans and t-shirt and an amazing um, scarf that has got the uh, waving cat on it, which is the uh, mascot of the AV team and is in fact recording this talk as a member of the AV team right now. <laughs> Here we have a, uh, somebody who does judo wearing a t-shirt that demonstrates a judo move. Here we have an extremely practical outfit. We have got the uh, bandana of the volunteers, the lanyard of the code of conduct, the laptop of somebody who needs to be doing a lot of uh, online work, and the backstage pass of somebody who needs to go backstage all the time and also like some rainbows and bright hair because 
show your personality, people. <laughs> Jeans and t-shirt, dress it up a bit, make it a polo shirt. <laughs> still, still good. Here we have somebody wearing a kilt. This has become their professional identity. They wear a kilt everywhere now, and they are the person in the kilt. Here is some uh, amazing uh, autumn tones with some amazing bright colored bag. That bag um, is, I'm showing you that fashion does not have to be expensive. You can get that bag at Kmart if you want to look this amazing. <laughs> this outfit, entirely secondhand bought from op shops. The most environmentally friendly way to uh, dress yourself. And these earrings are the ones that were mentioned in uh, yesterday's morning's keynote as being distracting because they have flashing lights on them. <laughs> Uh, here is a hat that has been to conferences in seven different countries, I believe. And uh, just an amazing t-shirt that sparks joy. So many little things on it. I love it. Uh, here we see a t-shirt designed by an artist that is liked by the person who is wearing it. And a hand-stitched kippah from a shop in Jerusalem that shows the name of the person who is wearing it. Uh, here we have some uh, professional wear, almost entirely black, just that splash of colour to uh, bring things out. Love it. Here we have some professional wear with a gorgeous shirt that, if you can see the details on it, is hiding fairy tale stories in plain sight. You would never notice them unless you're looking closely. I love it. Uh, here is somebody who, although they are not wearing pink, you can tell just from the way they stand that they wear pink all the time. Is that not <laughs> the pinkest pose you have ever seen? <laughs> Here is somebody who uh, is wearing a warm coat because they are Tasmanian <laughs> and has selected a dress that reminds them of the uh, carpet that their great-grandparents liked. <laughs> Here we have some more business casual, and there is a very important detail on this uh, particular outfit in that this is the business dad of Python who is wearing a Django belt buckle. <laughs> and when you wear signs of your identity like that Django belt buckle, you find people start seeing you and they come out of the woodwork and suddenly people wearing coats and Django shirts will come to find you. And people wearing Django shirts with unicorn skirts and unicorn socks and hand dyed shoes because sometimes you cannot get the shoes that you want to wear. Um, and it just like jeans and t-shirt. Django again, and soon the entire team comes together. <laughs> so I'm going to show you another one of the uh, signs that people can uh, weave into their outfits. Here is a uh, skirt which you might recognize the colors of this skirt as being the trans flag. And in case that's not awesome enough, the skirt also does this. <laughs> when you wear a flag, you are the flag bearer, right? Before, like hundreds of years ago, the flag bearer was the most important person in the army because they showed you that your side is up and is fighting and you have someone to rally around and someone to stand behind and someone to protect and someone to be with. You will bring people to you. And so people who are wearing outfits that they would not necessarily feel safe wearing everywhere because in some places, if you wear a masculine top half with a feminine bottom half, people will tell you not to. And to quote from many of the uh, talks this pike on, those people are wrong. You should wear the clothes that you like. And when, when your allies are there, this next slide has asked to be anonymous, so I'm going to request that there are no photos of the next slide. When your allies can be seen, soon people can come out who are at a conference of hundreds of people presenting female in public for the first time in their lives. And we say to them, welcome to PyCon. What do you work on? I love your outfit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a, a, a wonderful example of uh, exactly what this community is about. So thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Chris. OK, Ridwin, uh, you are up on deck. Uh, Michael Farrell, you have one slide? What? One, one slide? You're just going to tell us how to, that's one slide, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Um, it can't be anything hard like quantum mechanics or anything like that. So I'm going to talk to you about how to uh, solve a classical programming interview problem, which is re uh, reversing a string. So uh, Python is terrible for uh, interviewing because it's way too easy. It has too many batteries included. And it makes common tasks very simple, like slicing. So some of the uh, forms you may have seen include 
uh, having a sequence and you specify a start and an end, you get the substring, uh, you specify only the end, you get truncation, you specify only the start, you chop off the beginning of the string. Uh, one of the other things you can do with this is specify a step value, um, which is the number of elements to advance each time. Uh, and because this is Python, you can uh, make that step value negative and you just use this to reverse your string. Job done, let's go home, end of lightning talk. That's uh, so like four minutes left, yeah. Right. <laughs> But there's a problem, and it's 2019, so we need to handle Unicode, and so let's put some Japanese text in, and it breaks. Uh, because it's Python 2, and we didn't use the Unicode type. Uh, but thankfully, it's 2019, and so we have uh, Python 3, and its, type, uh, its string type is Unicode by default, so everything works, and we have success. So, Japanese was easy, you say. Let's, uh, so testing with French should be an absolute piece of cake. Uh, we don't have anything to work. It broke. What? The Cedilla moved. So there's a useful uh, tool for debugging this in the Python standard library called uh, Unicode Data. Um, and I reveal that our Cedilla was not actually part of the C, uh, so when the string was reversed, it jumped over to the A. Um, so Unicode gives us identical looking strings that are not actually identical. Um, the string was in normal form D, which is decomposed into component parts. If it were in normal form C, then the C would be C with Cedilla instead. Uh, Unicode data.normalize can transform between these two forms and a couple of others. And the bonus is when I was posting this test in text into Google Slides, it then converted things into normal form C, and then when I ran my tests again, it broke. <laughs> Uh, other side effects of this include the len function, which tells us the number of Unicode points used to compose a character, and this can differ depending on the form. Um, but if there's a system that annoys you that has a minimum character count uh, that you need to get up to, just decompose your characters and you get some more. Uh, and combining characters are not the only thing to work, break in strange ways, like flags. Say we have this flag of the United States. What happens when we reverse it? We get the flag of the Soviet Union. <laughs> Stop. Uh, and this is because they're all based on ISO Alpha 2 codes and SU equals Soviet Union. Unfortunately, no for, uh, fonts actually implement the Soviet Union flag um, because the Soviet Union was deprecated before Unicode. Uh, now, zero width joiners are also used as modifiers for some emoji, and so re reversing this astronaut emoji shows as component parts. Uh, and Microsoft has their own zero width joiner emoji combinations, like this cat riding a dinosaur, which is composed of cat paste, zero width joiner, and dragon. And unfortunately, reversing this dragon on a Windows 10 machine does not result in a dinosaur riding a cat <laughs> yet. But what is the correct answer anyway? Um, Perl 6 handles Unicode strings in something called normalization form grapheme. Each letter and kana here is a grapheme. The combi combination of the C and the Cedilla together are a grapheme. Uh, regardless of how it's composed. The whole flag and the whole uh, composed astronaut emoji are each a grapheme. And mic even Microsoft's dinosaur riding cat is preserved. Now, because it's actually about Python, uh, I went about trying to find a solution for this that didn't involve using C types uh, to call out to Perl 6. <laughs> and thankfully there's a solution, uh, Al Alvin Lidstrom's uh, grapheme library. Uh, and now you can reverse all of your complicated Unicode strings and they stay in one piece. Thank you. I find that I get to the, uh, to the end of most PyCons deciding to never write a program that will handle text ever again. Uh, that's probably covered me for the next three years, so thank you, Michael. Uh, on deck we have Sam Blackwell. Um, Ridwin is about to tell us how to patch for better results and more cancer. Damn. <laughs> right. As I said, better, faster, stronger, more cancer because we're here, we care about results, we care about doing the best, we care about optimizing and we're going to optimize hard like nature does. So let's talk about hepatitis B. Um, hepatitis B is a virus that has about 2 billion people infected worldwide. It's a huge virus. Um, a lot of people get it in childhood. Um, you can get it from your mum. You can get it from um, other people's blood. And so when people think that, they think needles and stuff. But it's also things like playground accidents and not being good about um, band-aids and stuff like that. Kids, kids are terrible. So. But hepatitis B 
it's not that good a virus. I like to think of it as a 1x virus. It's, <laughs> you know, once you get it, it doesn't necessarily become chronic. And even if it does become chronic, then you've got a 25% lifetime risk of cirrhosis or liver cancer. Now, OK, fine, you might say a 25% risk of liver cancer, but that's only a 1 in 5 conversion rate, 1 in 4. I'm good at maths, apparently. Excellent. So moving on, what can we do? Can we make this better? Yes, we can. We can upgrade. Nature has been upgrading for a long time. There are things called Delta viruses, viruses that you can only get if you already have another virus that it sticks itself onto the end of. There is a virus called Hepatitis Delta, or Hepatitis D for short. It is the Delta virus of Hepatitis B, and I could not find a good photo of it, so you don't get a photo. Um, it's great. It's the kind of efficient virus you want in your life. It's got a 70 to 90% lifetime chance of liver cancer or cirrhosis in people who catch it. <laughs> and it does this really efficiently. It has only 1,679 nucleotides to encode this massive increase in cancerous nature. Now, you might be saying, that doesn't sound good at all. And you're right. <laughs> Hep D, not good. It's nasty in the acute phase, and your long-term outcomes are really bad. If you don't think this is good, we can do something about it. We can vaccinate against hepatitis B. If you're young and Australian, you're probably already vaccinated for hep B. Uh, if you're older, you can access vaccines. If you were born somewhere else, if it was the UK, you probably weren't vaccinated. And if it was anywhere else, you need to talk to someone who understands their vaccine programs, because I don't. You can treat hep B and therefore avoid hepatitis D. Um, and you can do a whole bunch of safety practices to avoid or lower your risk of contracting it. I guess what I'm saying is maybe we don't just want to optimize. Maybe, and I feel like this is a theme that has come out of this talk, when you say we can do this better, faster, stronger, maybe we want to ask, are we doing this better than a virus? Are, are we in a more ethical state than the theoretical designer of hep D? <laughs> Have more ethics than a virus, everyone. Thank you very much. Correct. Round of applause for cancer. <laughs> OK, uh, up on deck we have Paul Amazona. But yeah. first, Sam, who's going to talk, us, talk to us about playing with Python. Thank you. Ooh. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a human. I'm an entry-level piano player, and I'm a master's student at a three-year institute at ANU. This is me with the 15 incredible people that I've spent the year doing coursework with, understanding how to take AI, big data, and embedded systems to scale and understand what we're doing when we get there. In the first half of the year, we were given a pretty open-ended task to build something. And in trying to find some inspiration, I went back to some of the big strategic machine learning advances in the last few years. AlphaGo, and before that, Deep Blue, defeated the world champions at Go and chess. But the inspirational part to me was that in their post-game reflections, Lisa Dong and Gary Kasparov spoke of the AI as having created something new, new strategy, new insights, something that they'd never seen before. And that led me to ask a question, if AI could be the source of creativity, if we could build something that created something new in and of itself. There's a question here about what is art that I'm going to steer entirely around. And instead, I sit around trying to build a creative AI-powered piano, play a duet with it, and see how that felt. I'm going to jump right to the end and say I built two pianos and let you judge the creative merits of them. The first ended up being a bit more like an AI teacher. It would play a chord under a simple melody. 
if and only if it judged that melody being worthy of Bach or Beethoven or Mozart or somebody in the classical uh, training set. And that felt a little bit punitive and it was interesting as a start. But then as I was playing with these early systems, I felt that I was being influenced. My composition was changed by a chord selection, by a timing, by something I wasn't expecting. And so much of music is anticipation. And I wanted to complete that feedback loop and have a true duet. So I built a feedback loop into the second piano. And in real time, it could retrain its neural network if the human sitting behind it thought it had missed a chord or played one that it shouldn't have. To get to this point, there's sort of two big pieces that I want to share with you. And the first is to bring something like this into the creative space. And the first is getting good data. And I'm happy to go out on a record and say that this is always going to be a critical piece of a machine learning program. Going from the physical instantiation, the record on the right hand side, to something that humans intuitively understand, to something that passes through Python, is a lossy process. You need to think about what you lose along the way, what's represented, what gets left out. And there's the big questions behind that as well. Who are you choosing to represent in your music? What genres? But in the creative space, some of these are choices that you can make for yourself. You can own them as part of your creativity. The styles, the people, the music that you choose to put in says something about the system that you create in the end. The second is around fitting. You always want something in the middle, the, mist, the magical Goldilocks zone between massively underfitted and jumping around so much that you can never predict something you've never seen before. My, uh, the version that felt like a piano teacher was a little bit overfit, but I thought of applications where you could lean into that and build a version that was a bit unpredictable, a bit unsmooth, more human maybe? That's for somebody else to experiment with. My other version was underfit so that the, fast, the last epochs could be provided by the person sitting behind the piano in real time and train it to a point where human and piano were playing together. That's all I can fit into my five minutes. I'd like to thank the 3A Institute, Autonomy, Agency, and Assurance are our big three questions, but we're open to many more. And we're also open to master's applications for our 2020 intake. And I'd like to shout out Michael Nielsen's book, Neural Networks and Deep Learning, as a really good place to jumpstart yourself into a program like this. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Not much stage back there. Okay, uh, Daniel Devaris, uh, you are up on deck, but first Paul is going to talk to us about reproducible environments. Hi, I'm Paul, and I'm from Singapore. Together with a number of lead volunteers, uh, we help organize a nonprofit called DataKind. We use data science to help nonprofits get insights from their data to help their communities better. In line with this, we organize meetups and projects where volunteers can help other uh, corresponding nonprofits. One of the practices we advocate in DataKind is reproducibility. We want to be able to reproduce a volunteer's work results insights a few years down the road in another machine, which could be Linux, Windows, or Mac OS. And yes, we have volunteers with diverse backgrounds, skills, and operating systems. One of the initial initiatives we explored to address this reproducibility concern is environment containerization using Docker. This way, we'll be able to snapshot the environment and during the analysis and invoke the, invoke the, the same in the future when we need to rerun the same. Hence, we asked our volunteers to install Docker, pull the environment image from the Docker registry so that they can anal analyze and produce the corresponding deliverable, which could be a notebook, script, visualization, and so on. And once they're done, they're going to send the pull request to the project repo. But if there is anything uh, missing, like a missing library, they need to like, con contact our project co coordinator to add it to the image, put it in the Docker registry, and then they'll download again the uh, environment. So we get some challenges in the first approach. Not all of our volunteers are able to install Docker on their machines. And downloading Docker images can sometimes take forever. Hence, 
we enhanced the workflow a bit. We got a few of our volunteers to serve as Docker captains. It's our fancy title or role for the ones ensuring that the deliverables produced by the volunteers are reproducible so that our volunteers can just focus on analysis and producing the deliverable. Having dedicated volunteers ensuring reproducibility kind of works, but can we do better? So this year, we started to explore another tool called Binder for this use case. It's, we find it very easy. Now our volunteers can just go to the project repository, look at the overview of the project, read the uh, contributing uh, document, and then they don't have to install anything on their machine. They're just going to launch a Binder. And then from that, um, it will create a corresponding uh, environment for them. I have here, which is already ready. It will spawn um, Jupyter environment. But if you don't like Jupyter notebooks, you can just change this tree to lab, and then you'll have a Jupyter lab uh, environment where you can do your usual uh, Python thing, like uh, do one plus one, and then uh, you can do uh, <laughs> yeah, you can do uh, your usual uh, terminal. Uh, drag it there somewhere, and then uh, edit your uh, uh, script, uh, explore your data, and if they are finished with their job, they can use uh, Git to uh, send a pull request. And then they may ask, how, how easy it is to uh, prepare this environment, right? So you can just uh, have a folder there uh, called binder, um, set the runtime, um, which is like 3.6 I used, and then uh, do the uh, requirements with the corresponding libraries and environments. And then just copy the uh, same um, link and go to my binder, paste it there. And then you can either launch the environment directly from there or just have the binder uh, budge and then put it uh, in your readme file so that whenever your contributor uh, goes into your repo, you can just put a binder there and then they can launch the, the environment uh, directly and start uh, work on the contribution. So it makes our sort of workflow uh, a bit easier. Um, if you have any other ideas on reproducible environments, uh, just let me know. Uh, we can discuss more uh, after the session. Thanks. That was really cool. Uh it's always a struggle to, to share usable uh, working environments with other people, and that looks like it makes, uh, makes it really easy. So uh, thank you, Paul. Um, Carla Burnett, you're up on deck. Uh, this next talk pro uh, promised me some linear re regression, and that's one of my favorite things, so I, I accepted it without looking at the title. Uh, so here's Daniel. <laughs> Hi, my name is Daniel, and I'm a Year 12 student. Um, I just wanted to say, did anyone see the talk uh, social media data using entropy theory today? Uh, well, a few days ago, I was looking at it and then the presentations, and I got really inspired to write a meme classification algorithm. In fact, I was so inspired that I forgot to go to the talk. Um, so if anybody can catch me up after it, that'd be really great. Um, so why do I like memes? Memes are cool, memes are relevant, generally help make sense with the world, comedy, yeah, um, they're also my exclusive method of learning data science. Um, so how could I share this profound joy with people? Um, would they ever really truly appreciate my memes? And how could I be sure if the, my memes are cool? So logically, I would need to make a meme classifier. That way, uh, <laughs> that way I could be sure that I was sharing the best memes. Um, at that point, I knew I would need a database of sorts and in order to make my evaluations about that broader spectrum um, of memes and, and for that I would need a data source. Um, so the, basically the approach that I took was it was using, a, uh, using the Python Reddit API wrapper. Um, I was able to create a scraper function to get my data in the form of uh, pandas data frame object. Um, so the data we ended up getting was a file uh, with the meme post um, score and the URL and a few other details um, that you can see on the right here, you've got the URL. Um, so now that I have my data, it's time to start uh, classifying some memes, uh, hopefully. And for that, I would need to find a correlation between my data and uh, the Reddit score. So yeah, linear regression. So yeah, like I decided to use linear regression. It seemed quick. Um, but the question was, the property of a meme would 
be like, like what property would I be comparing? And while I could have done some careful research into meaningful properties relating to popularity, I decided it would be uh, <laughs> quicker if I just guessed some arbitrary values and got some nice looking correlation results. Uh, <laughs> so um, here's my code for linear regression. Um, it's basically a bit of pandas magic, uh, some sklearn and matplotlib. Uh, uh, takes the score of the length of the mean text value, which I also got from the scraper, and tries to measure the correlation. I performed analysis on other variables, such as the length of the text, the uh, color theory, and the use of negative spaces. However, um, didn't really work um, <laughs> at all. Uh, in fact, performing the analysis on these variables yields detrimental correlation values. Ultimately, this would be a very painful method um, to use uh, for meme classification. Um, so I was a bit stuck. Uh, and while I was pondering in defeat, um, that's when my friend Stefan came along and pointed out the possibility of using a neural network um, to classify the data. So I decided it was time to get my hands dirty at this point and really get into it. I appointed um, implementation. Um, at this point, I implemented a convolutional neural network using the Reddit score as our uh, validation data and training on 900 images. Um, uh, related to the uh, popularity from the means of like 1 to 10 classifying them. Um, so, yep, this is the layers code. I've got a bunch of layers um, there. Um, this is the uh, pre-processing data. So I've got a function here for the converts the URL to an actual image, then, uh, then array format, then a H5 data, and then the regularization and the pipeline. Um, if that made no sense, don't worry, I don't get it either. <laughs> um, so I've got that one there, yep, and the labels um, and my images, uh, which I pass in there. Um, so yeah, demo, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep. So yeah, sometimes like it does this, you just put in the URL here, which you can get from anywhere. Um, if it just takes too long to load, that's cool. It probably doesn't work anyway. Um, so. <laughs> Um, here's the results. As you can see, um, I'm actually getting a, a result for everything. Um, so does it work? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> They'll let any old kid to get a neural net these days. Uh, if you are managing a computer science program at a university, uh, Daniel will be in the front soliciting PhD scholarships after this, so come up and see him. Uh, on deck we have uh, Nicole Bayona, but first Carla Burnett is going to tell us about doing irresponsible things. Hello everyone, my name is Carla and I work as a security engineer at Stripe. Uh, and when I started my job, I thought that being a security engineer would be like in the movies, right? Like you're breaking into things and you're wearing a hoodie and you're working in a dark room. And sometimes that is true because my team is in the States. So in winter, I have to start work before the sun rises. But after I started, I found that my work involved some amount of being the fun police. I spent time asking people to please not implement their own cryptographic primitives. <laughs> or, or explaining why it was a good idea and like not to respond to the phishing email. I know it sounds like it'd be cool, but it's just like not generally a great idea. But you know how you have those moments where you want to do something and you know it's a bad idea and you know you shouldn't do it, but you choose to do it anyway. Yeah, I had one of those. Uh, so I decided in my spare time to build my own SSH client. Uh, <laughs> including the cryptography. <laughs> so I believe in setting realistic goals, and I just wanted to be able to SSH to my own server and cat a file. I knew absolutely nothing about how SSH worked, except that it did so on port 22. <laughs> so I connected to the port to see what happened. And the server sent back a banner message saying that it was running OpenSSH on Ubuntu. And I thought, great, I will also be OpenSSH on Ubuntu <laughs> from my Mac. <laughs> So I replied with the same message and got back this really ginormous blob of inscrutable text that includes a lot of cryptography algorithms. So I thought I should maybe read the spec. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out there are actually four RFCs for SSH. They're all published at the same time. And I think there's four of them because it's really long and they wanted them to be in like chapters for bedtime reading. <laughs> uh, and it turns out this is the server trying to negotiate five different algorithms. 
One of them for how we set up secrets, one of them for how we tell who the server is, one of them for how we keep our communication private, one of them for how we prevent message tampering, and one of them to keep things small. The server's told us which of these algorithms it speaks, and you're supposed to pick whichever one you think sounds best to you. There's a lot of algorithms, and I'm doing this as a weekend project, so I just picked the ones that sounded the most familiar. Because I work in security, this is almost certainly the one with the most vulnerabilities that's been in the news lately. <laughs> Once you and the server have agreed on the algorithms you want to speak, you need to figure out the keys for each one in a process known as key exchange. If you've got a fantastic memory, I just mentioned that I used Diffie-Hellman for this. Uh, Diffie-Hellman's based on the discrete logarithm problem. Essentially, you take one number, you raise it to the power of another, you mod it with a third, and it's really hard to get the original numbers back. Most importantly, if you were at Paul's talk on Friday, you'll know there's a really easy and insecure way to do this in Python. Great. We'll set G and P to be some hard-coded values, generate a random X, use the value E, send it over to the server, the server responds, we take that, we also raise it to the X, we mod it with P, and we get a shared key. Great. Now I need to check that the server is who it says it is. The SSH spec doesn't say how to do this the first time you connect. It says it's left to future implementers. Those implementers are still in the future. That is why you see this message. <laughs> For subsequent requests, we can check that the server stays the same, though. My server flat out refused to use anything other than elliptic curve crypto for this, which is hard. It involves maths they don't understand. I used a Python library, and I probably wasn't talking to my server. Cool. Let's go back to that shared key. We don't actually use the shared key. Instead, we use it to generate a bunch of baby keys, one in each direction for IV, encryption, and Mac. We, use that using the, we generate those using the power of the alphabet. Take the shared key, we stick the literal character A afterwards. We run it through a hash, and with the power of cryptography, we have a new key. <laughs> we then do it for B, C, D, E, and F as well, and we have a transport layer, so we can talk to our server securely. It's the equivalent of TLS for HTTPS. But we also need to authenticate the user to know whether or not they can act as a particular person on the system. That's where your SSH public key or password come in. I chose to use my public key just because it seemed like a good idea at the time. That meant that the server would send me a challenge, I'd reply with my private key and send it back, and the server would validate that it was correct. This meant more cryptography that I don't have time to explain, but it was RSA, so I definitely did it wrong and implemented it insecurely. <laughs> okay, once you've authenticated yourself to the server, you're done. Not quite. Uh, it turns out that SSH supports lots of different applications, among them port forwarding, X11, and the shell that I was looking for. You can actually multiplex these different usages over the one SSH connection if you want to. But I don't think anything does in the real world. I didn't care about X11 or port forwarding, and so I just set up a session channel, set up a shell, and got my Ubuntu welcome banner. Yay! Yay. <laughs> you add a read eval print loop, and you get to cut the file. What should you learn from this? SSH is really cool. You use it every day. You should read about how it works. Building your own crypto is fun. As a security engineer, I have to tell you, don't do it in production. You can chat to me on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, why get something off the shelf when you can do it yourself? Uh, speaking of getting things off the shelf, uh, William Brown, you're on deck. <laughs> Thank you. Again. Okay. Uh, if you have kids in childcare, uh, you need to leave the room now and collect your children, otherwise they'll be locked up in the convention centre. No, that's not what will happen, but please go and get your kids anyway. Um, Nicole Bayona is going to talk to us did you actually prepare for this? No! Great! <laughs> Woo! Okay, hi guys. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how to improvise a lightning talk. And I don't have any slides because I'm improvising. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually funny story about that. So I like to think of improvising as master procrastination. Because if you think about it, you're like, uh, okay, so I've got this set of things I need to do. Uh, so like you got an assignment or whatever and you're like, I'm going to leave this to the last minute and I'm going to improvise <laughs> and magically get an A. Woo! So first I'm going to talk about what not to do. Uh, don't like, just before you do your speech, don't just run away, run away and scream and go, ah, because, um, or actually do go run around and scream because that gets your energy um, out. And sometimes you just need to release your energy out, you know? Uh, a thing you do want to do, though, is get your audience to interact. So everybody, just to get me comfortable, say, ah, with me. Ah! Woo! Okay, good. Uh, so a fun thing to do when you're improvising, because I didn't prepare for this, right? Just get your audience to just really laugh. Do something silly. Walk around with a cup on your head. <laughs> yeah. 
And that just gets everybody laughing. Just put a cup on your hand and just be like, I am a robot. I am totally a robot now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and just be chill, have eye contact. I'm looking at all of you. I'm not staring at all of you. I'm just casually glancing my gaze. There is a lot of you. <laughs> um, yeah, so just be chill, do something super silly, and kind of wonder if I can put this, just keep this in my head for the rest of the talk while I move around like this. Uh, does anyone bet, does anyone want to bet money that I can keep on doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. Uh, but yeah, uh, in all seriousness, uh, this is my first time talking at PyCon at an, and at any conference. So, um, woo! woo! <laughs> yeah. Uh, how much time do I have left? <laughs> oh, okay, how much did you want? <laughs> Yeah, uh, which reminds me, at the end, let's just do a countdown for 10 seconds because <laughs> there's nothing more fun than doing a countdown. <laughs> okay, uh, Katie, you're on deck. Uh, but first, I'm really, really, really sorry. It's William Brown. <laughs> Stop! Welcome to the history of history and politics. Now, yesterday I had the joy of taking you on the uh, ride that no one expected, discussing the supermarkets of Australia and New Zealand, which apparently you're really passionate about. And a lot of people have just been asking me, but why did I do this? And so I'm going to give a very different talk today, which is about why a talk like this was put together and how the magic was done. We all see amazing speakers in an event like PyCon, and we think, wow, how could I be like that? We see people like Chris, Merrin, Benno, Lee, Emily, Tom, and so many more, and we think they're all magicians. It's really easy to feel overwhelmed by these people around us. They're so talented, and they give such well-thought-out talks. How could we ever measure up? How could we bring an entire conference to be wrapped in our words, to bring them knowledge or emotions so effectively? They make it look easy, but you're awesome. You all have things that you know or unique knowledge overlaps. Like Emily said, you should and can speak. So let's dive into how my lightning talk was made so you can make your own talks. Step one is to have an idea. Honestly, having an idea is the hardest part. History and politics was thought of in January in LCA. The idea for the talk was actually a conversation between four of us on a bus. We discussed how the community changed as, since they left Christchurch and came back, and how landmarks like supermarkets were different, but none of us knew how or why. Really, having ideas for a lightning talk can be anywhere before a PyCon. You have a huge amount of time. Conversations with people that are interesting or your expertise areas are a great places to start having ideas. The next thing is to ask yourself, what do you want people to walk away with from that talk? I wanted people to be interested in something that we all interact with and have in our communities, but are such part of normal life that we just don't always acknowledge. I also wanted you to laugh. Um, now, the next thing is to have a story. And for this, I like to write notes and to come up with a plan. I took an entire weekend to research this and made a timeline of the history. There's two, it's two pages long. This is only half of it. And only two thirds of that content made it to the talk. But all of this research can become a blog post or tell people over dinner. It's amazing how much overlap there is in this knowledge sharing and your work can take many forms and it's absolutely as fun at this research stage. And that research becomes a story and a story flows. It works towards your goal, which is what you want remembered. Curate that, keep it focused. Like we heard yesterday, you work upside down from the point you want to make to the story and journey that takes you there. Now practice it. This is important. You'll make mistakes in your story. You'll polish your speaking notes. You don't have Chris pressuring you over time in practice. <laughs> and I tried to aim for about 10% short of my segment. Four minutes 30 in a lightning talk. You will need that safety buffer. I had to speed up yesterday with one minute 30 to go because I knew I wouldn't make it. So I do this at home. I have friends over and I'll give presentations in my house. And even if this talk was never going to make it to PyCon, I had a lot of fun doing that because I like being an idiot. <laughs> I gave this talk at least five times before I got up on stage. Now just do it. Just do it. <laughs> Actually, it's really not that easy. Even yesterday, I was really nervous. We all are. 
PyCon has a ton of people, actually 42 tons of people, which is equivalent to 1.4 Mel Melbourne trams. <laughs> so that's a lot of people, and standing in front of you all is scary no matter who you are. We're all human, and every amazing speaker you see, they feel nervous before they talk. 10 seconds is all it takes. If you can get through the first 10 seconds, the nerves wear off. I used to train with an Olympic judo athlete, and he would say the first 10 seconds are the scariest, but after that, you get into the flow, you get to the groove. You've got this. You've done your practice, and that repetition kicks in. This is why the practice is so important. You did it before you can do it again. And afterwards, people come to you because you've inspired them. I've learned so much since that talk. Woolworths Campbell Street in Hobart still has purity tiles in its car park. Animatronic vegetables were at Big Fresh in New Zealand supermarkets. Perth exists, had a supermarket <laughs> called Action, and Action was founded in 1970 and bought by Woolworths in 2005. And in a really bold move, a 2019 Sydney ICC, Cockle Bay Room was acquired by Coles. <laughs> now, let's recap. Have your idea. How do you want to be remembered? What's your story? Practice. Give the talk and have fun at every point. And you too can look exactly like this in front of a room of 650 people. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs>